Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Jerry Zaremski and I'm the Washington Bureau Chief for the Buffalo News and President of the National Press Club. I'd like to welcome our club members and their guests who are here with us today, as well as the audience that's watching on C-SPAN. We're looking forward to today's speech, and afterwards, I will ask as many questions as time permits. Please hold your applause during the speech so that we have as much time for questions as possible. For our broadcast audience, I'd like to explain that if you hear applause during the speech, it may be from the guests and members of the general public, and not necessarily from the members of the working press. I'd now like to introduce our head table guests and ask them to stand briefly when their names are called uh, from your right. Ken Melgren, uh, AP Broadcast Affiliate Relations Manager, Head of the Radio and TV Museum in Bowie, Maryland, and a member of the Press Club's Broadcast Committee. Heather Forsgren Weaver, Managing Editor of Satellite Week and Satellite Beat Reporter for Communications Daily. David Johnson, of Scripps Howard News Service Chief Technology Officer and a member of the Press Club Broadcast and New Media Committees. Chris Stern, Media rep Reporter for Bloomberg. Richard Wiley, partner in Wiley Rain LLP and a former Com Federal Communications Commission Chairman and a guest of the speaker. Sarah Williams, a, vo a Voice of America news anchor and a producer of the Press Club's XM radio broadcasts. Gary Parsons, Chairman of the Board of XM Satellite Radio and a guest of the speaker. Skipping over the, the uh, podium, Angela Greiling Keene of Bloomberg News, the Chair of the NPC Speakers Committee. Skipping over our speaker, Ron Bajans of Kuwait New News Agency and the Speakers Committee member who organized today's event. Joelle Frank, Managing Partner and Joelle Frank Wilkinson Brimmer Catcher and a guest of the speaker. Jamila Bay, freelance radio reporter and a member of the Press Club Young Members Committee and our Professional Development Committee. Mary Lou Donahue, producer editor of Artistically Speaking. Keith Hill, editor writer with BNA and vice chairman of the Press Club Board of Governors. And Sam Holt, former head of programming at both National Public Radio and the Public Broadcasting System, former senior vice president for content at World Space, the first satellite radio company, and a member of the Press Club Broadcast Committee. Our speaker today has reshaped the American radio industry, and he's not done yet. If Sirius Satellite Radio CEO Mel Karmazin gets his way, the two giants of satellite radio, Sirius and XM, will soon be one. That's a monumental change, and it's the sort of thing Karmazin has specialized in throughout his career. In the early 1980s, radio was largely a, a local enterprise, but then Karmazin took the helm of Infinity Broadcasting. Over the next few years, he built Infinity into a 180-station behemoth that, along with its rival, Clear Channel Communications, came to dominate the industry. Infinity came to dominate in part because of Karmazin's decision to hire a controversial New York DJ who had been fired by his previous employer for his vulgar on-the-air rants. That shock jock's name was Howard Stern, and the rest is radio history. But Mel Karmazin is much more than the man that made Howard Stern famous. After Westinghouse bought Infinity, Karmazin became head of CBS Radio. And when Viacom bought, bought CBS, Karmazin became president and chief operating officer of Viacom, suddenly the second largest enter entertainment company in the world. Karmazin left Viacom for personal and professional reasons in June 2004, and five months later he was named CEO of Sirius, one of two pioneers in the fledgling satellite radio business. And before long, he proved that he was, well, serious about it, signing Howard Stern to a multi-million dollar contract. Back then, Karmazin saw the satellite radio industry a little differently than he sees it today. Calling Sirius and XM the Coke and Pepsi of the business, he said, it's a big market, both companies will be very successful. Now though, Karmazin wants those two companies to merge, and not everyone is thrilled about that prospect. The National Association of Broadcasters has joined with consumer groups to ask federal regulators to stop the merger, saying it will create a satellite radio monopoly. But Karmazin stresses that there will still be extraordinary competition in the radio business, even if the merger goes forward. 
uh, Carmazon, who would head the newly merged company, told Congress that the merger would be in the best interest of consumers because it would give them more radio choices at lower prices than they have today. Carmazon is here with us today to tell us more about the merger. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mel Carmazon to the National Press Club. Thank you very much. So, um, first of all, thank you very much. Um, there are a couple things that I, I just feel a responsibility to get the record straight on. Uh, I did not hire Howard Stern. Howard Stern uh, was at uh, Sirius before I got here. Um, and as a matter of fact, it was uh, Sirius's decision to hire Howard Stern that made me uh, believe how serious they were. And I joined probably um, as, you know, as a result of that. Um, I really um, would like to thank you all for uh, being here and thank you, uh, Jerry, uh, for the opportunity uh, that you're giving me. I'd also like to acknowledge, because I see him looking at me, uh, former chairman of the FCC, Jim Quello, who's in the ro room, as well as Senator Laxalt, who is in the room, and thank you both uh, for joining us today. Um, I'm also, um, you know, delighted to be here with Gary Parsons, uh, chairman of XM Radio, uh, and thanks to members of the National Press Club for giving me the invitation to speak to you today. I know there has been a great tradition in using this prestigious platform to speak on important matters, and we have some important matters that we are undertaking today, and we have a groundbreaking announcement that we can think of no better place to make than here at the National Press Club. In keeping with my long service in radio, I'd like to give you the headline right on the top. We plan to use the synergies of this merger to bring a la carte programming to satellite radio, to give consumers the power to choose satellite radio packages channel by channel to suit their tastes and their budgets. This is the first time that anyone in subscription entertainment has ever offered a la carte programming. Gary and I are excited to bring this unprecedented benefit to American consumers. We said when we announced our merger that we would provide more choices and lower prices than ever before, and that's what we're going to do. After the merger, here's how they will work. Sirius and XM will each offer an a la carte package, a la carte number one, for $6.99 per month. That's 46% lower than the only package that exists today. So the idea of lower prices is clearly presented here when we're committing to offer a package at $6.99 as compared to the $12.95 today. Consumers will choose the 50 channels they want from a universe of more than 100 music, sports, news, talk, and entertainment channels. Listeners will also have the option of purchasing additional channels for as little as 25 cents each. But no one, no one who selects this package will pay more than the $12.95 that they pay today. We will offer also a second a la carte package, a la carte two, at $14.99, featuring the best of both services. Consumers subscribing to this package will choose from 100 channels from a large pool, including the premium channels, on one service plus the best programming from the other service. To get this program from both companies today, you would have to pay $25.90 so for the two subscriptions and pay for two radios. So consumers will once again see a major price reduction. We also plan to offer six other packages of programming, including new, two new family-friendly packages. 
and I'll describe these a little bit later. Anyone choosing one of the family-friendly packages will be able to block the adult-themed programming and, for the first time, receive a price credit. So people who felt that they did not want to subsidize content that they didn't want coming into their home or in their car will no longer have to be subsidizing that content and we will give, not just block it, but we will also block and credit. Why do this? The answer is simple. Not only is it good for consumers, we believe it will be good for business as well. This is good for our shareholders as well as good for the consumers. We need to build the subscription business base of satellite radio to strengthen our business and better leverage our high fixed costs. We are confident that lower price points, more programming choices, and these a la carte offerings will help us do just that because these are what consumers want and we can't wait to bring these new products to market. Before I talk more about the future, I'd like to take you on a short tour of our recent past in audio entertainment. As was previously mentioned, I have been in the radio business my entire professional life since I started selling radio advertising in 1967. The pace of change in the industry was much slower then compared with today, but there was a lot of excitement in the 1960s over eight track tape players, seen then as a breakthrough in mobile portable recorded music players. Over the past 40 years, I've either been part of or observed the first hand, the evolution of audio entertainment. First at WCBS in New York, followed by Metromedia, where I work for John Kluge, then Infinity, later at CBS and Viacom, and now at Sirius. And I could say without a doubt that we are living in a truly unique time. History is likely to record this period as the revolutionary age in audio entertainment, a time when the only thing certain was rapid change. One thing is clear, with all of the audio choices available today, 2007 is a great year to be a consumer. For those of us in the business of delivering audio entertainment, it is also a very exciting time, full of challenge and opportunity. Just to think about this for a moment, many of the devices and technologies we hear so much about today, iPods and MP3 players, HD radio, the internet, entertainment delivered on cell phones and more, did not even exist 10 short years ago when Sirius and XM first received their licenses. Moreover, rarely does a day go by without an announcement about new devices or technologies that promise more power, higher quality, greater versatility, and improved accessibility. The iPhone is the most prominent device of late, but others like Slacker, a wireless internet portable music player, could prove in time to be significant in gaining share of the listening audience. To put this in perspective, about 10 years ago, advances in computer technology and the internet began to fundamentally change the way we work, communicate, learn, shop, and more. Remember life before email and Google. While the changes in audio entertainment do not pervade every aspect of our lives, like the internet-driven changes, I think it is fair to say that there are parallels both in the pace of change and the ways in which innovation and new technology are transforming business and consumer behavior in the audio entertainment business. As I mentioned earlier, all of this change has been great for consumers as these new sources of entertainment compete for a share of ear time and have become deeply rooted in our lives. Today, 116 million Americans enjoy iPods and MP3 players, with most new cars now including 
built-in jacks, these devices will increasingly be fixtures in automobiles. There are 72 million people who are listening to internet radio each month, a number likely to grow as new wireless players make internet delivered content accessible on the go. There are 23 and a half million phones that are equipped with music players, a number likely to rise rapidly spurred by the iPhone and the competitors that will develop to them. 14 million people subscribe to satellite radio, a number we hope to grow significantly as a result of our merger. And there is every reason to believe that these and other technology and services will continue to attract even more consumers in the years ahead. It is important to note that all of these choices and competition also bring important benefits to consumers, programmers, and society as a whole. Programmers today have multiple outlets in which they can distribute their content and potentially earn additional revenue streams. The explosion in delivery modes and channels enriches the diversity of our nation, providing opportunities for programmers and listeners alike to produce and enjoy niche entertainment, news, and information not available when I entered the radio business. One of the things I'm most proud of is our contribution to diversification of programming, including programs that attract strong minority, religious, and rural audience, among others. And after our merger, we believe that we can deliver even more. We also have redundancy in our national emergency systems so that in times of need, people can tune to satellite radio or terrestrial radio to get the information they need. And of course, consumers have more power than ever before to mix the music, the entertainment they want to hear, choose the genre of programs they want, and stay connected wherever they want to listen. Yet with all this change and competition, one fact has remained pretty much the same. Terrestrial radio is still the 800-pound gorilla in the audio entertainment market, with 230 million weekly listen, listeners, and radios capable of receiving their broadcasts in virtually every home and automobile in America. By contrast, Sirius has 300 channels, and we account for just 3.4% of the national radio audience as measured by Arbitron. The two companies combined, the total audience is 3.4%. Still, we're proud of what we've accomplished. We've invested in our infrastructure to support a growing business. We have secured diverse and premium content needed to attract listeners. Our radios are in millions of automobiles and homes across the nation, and the financial performance of both companies is improving. But we are always looking for ways that we can even do better to make satellite radio attractive to more listeners and be a stronger competitor in the market. And we believe strongly that our merger makes sense not only for our shareholders, but also for current and future subscribers. As many of you here know, there are two critical tests that our merger must pass to gain the necessary approvals. First, we must demonstrate that our merger is not anti-competitive, and secondarily, or equally important, we need to persuade regulators that our merger is in the public interest. Let's take them one at a time, beginning with the issue of whether the merger would have an adverse impact on competition. It's hard to imagine how the merger of two companies with a combined 3.4 percent 
of the na nationwide audience could harm competition. The market I described today is brimming with competition and will remain robust after our merger. Some argue that a merged company would have incentives to raise prices, but that argument also falls flat given that our largest and most potent competitor is terrestrial radio, and that's for free. With our small market share, the way we must grow our revenues is by increasing our subscriber base. And it simply defies logic that we can do that by increasing the price differential between our subscription service and the free service of our most potent competitor. Today, with our announcement that prices are going down, not up, after the merger, we should finally put this false argument to rest once and for all. Our adversaries in the broadcast industry have a different view of our merger. They claim satellite radio is a separate market and that satellite and AM FM are not competitors. But the question all of you should ask is this. Do you believe what the NAB and other broadcasters say about competition when their agenda is to block a merger and limit competition with their own AM FM stations or do you believe what they say about competition in their own radio consolidation filings before the FCC and in the company's disclosures filing with the SEC? The fact is that the positions taken by broadcasters are not just in conflict with us, they are in conflict with themselves. While they tell the FCC to stop our merger because satellite radio is a distinct market, their public filings and statements elsewhere tell a different story. For example, Clear Channel Communications filed against our merger at the FCC. Yet in a recent SEC filing, they could not have been clearer that satellite radio is a prime competitor, and here's what they wrote. Clear Channel said, our broadcasting business face increased competition from new broadcast technologies such as broadband, wireless, and satellite radio, and new consumer products such as portable digital audio players. Similarly, prior to telling Congress and the FCC that satellite is a distinct market, David Rear of the NAB boldly proclaimed at the NAB show last fall. In 2006, we have satellite and internet radio, and barely a day goes by without the introduction of a new competing device or service. But we have news for our competitors. We will beat you as we have beaten those change agents in the past. These examples where broadcasters explicitly state that satellite and terrestrial radio compete are far from unique. Filings by CBS, Spanish Broadcasting Systems, Disney, Entravision, Entercom, Univision, Emmis, Beasley, and Westwood One, to name a few, describe the market and competition in very similar terms. So when the broadcasters telling the FCC one thing about our merger and making contradictory statements elsewhere, the picture becomes very clear. The NAB and its allies do not oppose the merger of XM and Sirius because it will diminish competition overall. They oppose it in order to limit their competition. Indeed, this is the very same position the NAB has taken repeatedly over the years. In 1990, in 1992, in 1994, in 1995, and in 1997, when it tried to block or stop satellite radio from competing with terrestrial radio. So let me return now 
to the consumer benefits of our merger and how this merger is in the public interest. From the day we announced our merger on February the 19th, we said that the combination of the two companies would lead to more choices and lower prices for consumers and that no one would pay more for the services they have today. We based these promises on our belief that the merger would create significant efficiencies, providing both the resources and the flexibility needed to offer more programming choices and more price points for consumers. Many independent analysts have written that the merger will produce considerable merger-specific savings. They have said that near-term savings are estimated in the hundreds of millions of dollars per year, while the long-term cost savings are estimated to be in the billions of dollars. Sirius and XM has commissioned our own independent company to do an analysis, and the results of that study also found that the efficiencies from the merger will be in the hundreds of millions of dollars annually. We expect that the merger will allow the combined company to eliminate duplicate expenses, achieve economies of scale, and identify other cost and revenue synergies that could only exist within the merged company. More specifically, we expect synergies and savings in areas of programming and content, retail product development, satellite operations, broadcast operations. I believe there is not one line on our P&L where we will not achieve cost savings. Now I'd like to tell you more about how we're going to use these merger efficiencies to increase the choice and lower prices for consumers. The program options that we announced today will put unprecedented power in the hands of consumers to choose what they want to hear and what they want to pay for. They demonstrate plainly and persuasively that this merger is in the public interest. You may know that the NAB told the FCC in the filings that they made two weeks ago that it was clear that the merger wouldn't result in a la carte programming. Well, I've already told you that we're going to do exactly that. Clearly, the NAB got it wrong, again. In addition to our two a la carte packages, earlier I indicated that we will make six other programming options available to consumers, packages that will work with existing radios. We will offer fixed best of both bundles featuring all of the programs from either service and the most popular features from the other. The monthly cost for this service will be $16.99, 34% lower than the $25.90 that consumers have to pay today. We will also offer a family-friendly package of each service at $11.95 a month. That excludes all the adult-themed programming from the current channel offerings and reflects a price credit from the $12.95 package. In addition to this lower price family-friendly tier, we will also offer a family-friendly best of both package that adds select channels from the other service for $14.99, reflecting a credit as well. And we will offer two new fixed packages below the only price point that exists today of $12.95. And one will be mostly music, and the other will be mostly news, sports, and talk. Both of these will cost $9.99 a month. Finally, Consumers can continue to choose their existing Everything Serious and XM Everything at the current $12.95 programming like they do today. Our aim is to have all of these packages 
including the a la carte selections available beginning within the first year of approval of our merger. This is a major priority for us, and we will work to bring these packages into the market just as quickly as we can. For the a la carte packages, consumers will need new radios with the functionality to handle channel by channel selections. We're going to develop and market those radios, and those radios will be priced at the same price as our other radios. We are also going to have to ch change our billing systems as well as our operating systems. Consu consumers who choose these packages will make their channel by channel selections through a web interface. Once again, with the exception of the two a la carte offers, the rest of these plans will work with existing radios. So let me close now by giving you the bottom line as we see it. The merger should be approved because the audio entertainment market is as competitive as it has ever been, and it will remain so after the merger. Plus, the combination of XM and Sirius is in the public interest because it will result in unprecedented new choices and lower prices. Specifically, listeners will be able to choose among eight different programming packages versus only one choice today. And with the a la carte options, they will have for the first time the ability to select channels and choose price points that are right for them. No consumer will pay more for what they get today, and the new packages will give us, the consumers, the opportunity to pay less. Consumers who only want music or news or talk and information or family-friendly programming will be able to choose packages that provide them the types of channels they want. No radio will be obsolete that's in the market today. So we are especially excited about being able to bring a la carte programming to the American people for the first time. We are confident that giving consumers the ability to customize their own plans will be a win-win, a move that benefits subscribers and our business at the same time. We are also pleased that our views on the merger are shared by thousands and thousands of subscribers and a wide range of impressive organizations and businesses and experts who filed in support of the merger. The audio entertainment revolution already has resulted in intense competition, unprecedented choices for consumers, and valuable benefits for musicians and many other programmers. We want to do our part to continue to drive innovation choice, diversity, and all the other benefits that flow from intense competition. And with our merger, we will. Thank you very much. We now have lots of questions about the proposed merger, starting with this. Uh, do you think you've now done enough to get this merger through the FCC and the DOJ? Well, we believe that um, the merger should be approved uh, for the two reasons that I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, I don't think it has anything to do with whether, you know, we have done enough. We believe that the audio entertainment market is very competitive. Clearly, this merger will not be anti-competitive. So there's no reason from an antitrust point of view that the merger shouldn't be approved. From a point of view of being in the public interest, we believe that we have outlined uh, what our plans are to offer lower prices and more choices. We think the public interest is served when the consumer gets lower prices and more choices. Uh, you know, we certainly uh, want to get this merger approved. Uh, there's uh, substantial benefits for our shareholders in the billions of dollars of value, and we look forward to working with the regulators uh, to see if there's any concerns that they have uh, regarding this merger being approved. If this merger is not successful, what do you think will happen to the current model of satellite programming? 
Yeah, I, I think that I've said in the past, and I know that Gary Parsons has said it, that you know um, both companies will survive. Uh, you know, we believe that there is intense competition. We believe that if in fact we can merge and have the benefits of um, the efficiencies, we can be a better competitor. But uh, I believe both companies will continue to um, you know compete in a robust market. What would the merger mean for current subscribers? Well, again, I, I think the current subscribers and the future subscribers are in the same position. Um, certainly, no radio is obsolete. They're going to continue to get the programming that they have been getting, not have to pay a price increase. So, you know, it's a win-win for the existing subscribers because they'll have the opportunity if they wanted to receive some of our content. So, as an example, uh, if a uh, XM subscriber wanted the ability to get NASCAR and the NFL, that's something that we would hope that we might be able to deliver to them on their same receiver. Why is a la carte such an important offering for consumers? We think a la carte is a pure choice for consumers. So if you um, agree with me that um, giving consumers more choice and lower prices is a benefit and in the public interest, then giving consumers perfect choice by having a la carte is, a, um, is part of that process. So if there's somebody that doesn't want to take the time and go a la carte, we're saying we also have lower price packages you know, available to them. But you know, there are many people who have chosen uh, not to pay $12.95 a month to subscribe to radio. Um, and from our point of view, we compete with free. And the way we can compete more effectively with free is not to go from $12.95 to $14.95 or $15.95, um, but the way we can compete better with free is by executing the 46% price reduction that we've said in a la carte. So there will be consumers who don't want the full boat. You know, they don't want Howard Stern or they don't want Major League Baseball or they don't want, um, you know, the NFL. And what they really would like to have is a smaller offering. But they would like to have that offering at a more affordable price. And $6.99 a month, we believe, is a amazingly attractive price point uh, not that we think the 12.95, which is 43 cents a day, has priced us out, uh, you know, so uncompetitively. But the alternative to free, you know, is something that we deal with every day. And the 6.99 is a much more attractive competitor to free than is 12.95. Why haven't you offered an a la carte style of uh, programming previously? And will you offer it to consumers even if the merger is declined by regulators? Um, the reason we've not offered it in the past is that it's very simple, is that last year Sirius lost $1 billion. Uh, our company has not made a profit um, in the year since it started. Uh, so that uh, the idea of offering this a la carte service is made possible by the synergies connected with the merger. And it would be a very risky proposition for us with no um, sort of uh, f uh, way of covering the cost of this thing um, so that we would not have made it available. I, I can speak for uh, Sirius that if in fact the merger was not going to happen, we would have no plans of offering a la carte. Um, that the probable scenario is that if the merger is approved, there are eight packages, including the ability to block and credit you know, adult content, so that we would have uh, eight different packages available, starting price at $6.99. No consumer would pay more for what they're getting if the merger is approved. If the merger is not approved, I, the assumption should be that we're going to go back to one offering, $12.95. NAB is criticizing your a la carte announcement because saying that the new radios would be required. How do you respond to this criticism? Yeah, um, uh, we don't think it's a criticism. Um, we think it's just as a fact. And we uh, think that just in the same way that when uh, cable companies needed to offer certain things, they needed to go from analog to where you had a set-top box. So what we're saying is that we um, um, 
are going to offer our tiers and offer our existing service and offer the best of both services on our existing radios. If in fact somebody wants the a la carte service, they'll go in and buy the radio at a price point that's comparable to other radios and you should assume that we're going to be anxious to get as many of those people out there because we're looking to gain as many subscribers as possible and you shouldn't rule out the idea that there will be great incentives that we will offer people to be able to trade in their radio in to get a new a la carte radio. So this is something about us wanting to get a la carte service into as many homes and as many cars as we can and we will are highly incentivized because it'll give us a chance to compete again against the idea of, of free radio with a price point that we would financially because of the merger be able to do. How many subscribers would the new company need to, to uh, make a profit? Well, the uh, assumption is that um, uh, s uh, we have 14 million subscribers between the two companies, and today neither of those companies are, you know, making a profit. Um, I think that going forward, if you were to take a look at the likelihood of the company uh, making a profit, they would be greatly enhanced by the combination getting together and the efficiency. Obviously, the uh, combined satellite radio sector will be able to be profitable faster as a result of the merger because we'll be able to take advantage you know, of those synergies. But we have not forecast and, and we have not disclosed what the subscriber numbers that we need. Our hope is that we'll be adding a lot more subscribers at $6.99 as a result of the merger as compared to the $12.95. So, you know, we would need a, a good number of subscribers. I am confident that um, uh, serious, and I, I know Gary shares that confidence that in the future we will be profitable companies um, even if the merger doesn't happen. But we can't comprehend why the merger shouldn't happen because of the fact that we are dealing in a very competitive, robust market of audio entertainment. Why should these two satellite radio companies that reach 3.4% of the audience not be permitted to merge? Therefore, we meet the competition argument, and it would just be a shame if the merger didn't happen uh, for the consumers not to get the benefits of all of these lower prices that we're talking to about giving them as a result of the efficiencies from the merger. How long do you think it will take before satellite radio becomes the 800-pound gorilla it's been predicted to become? <laughs> Um, well, um, um, hopefully soon, if that were ever to be happen. Uh, I, I happen to be, I, I've been in the radio business for a long time, and uh, we were talking earlier today about uh, KDKA, you know, in Pittsburgh, an AM radio station that started in 1926. And when uh, FM radio and television and all of this technology came about, you know, the terrestrial radio business is still a very big terrific business. There's about $21 billion there, uh, you know, uh, anywhere between 95 and 97 percent of all Americans still listen to radio. When satellite radio is um, advanced even more than it is, it's still going to be aligned with AM and FM. S terrestrial radio is not going to go away. Uh, an awful lot of people rely on radio or should rely on radio or radio should be responsive for providing more local programming. And we think that if, you know, if I were a, back in my days of being in the terrestrial radio business, I don't think it would be hard for me to compete with satellite radio. I would just focus on local more than national. And I think that um, we will coexist. There'll be an AM button in your car. There'll be an FM button in your car. There'll be a satellite radio button in your car. You'll have a cell phone in your car that will have audio content. You'll have your MP3 player in the car. You'll have HD radio in the car. And there'll be all of this competition. And the one who wins in that environment is the consumer. And that's the way it should be. Um, how about the future of uh, HD radio? Um, I, I think HD radio is something that is uh, expanding. There are about 1,350 radio stations across the country that are broadcasting in HD. Um, again, that's another competitor that satellite radio has. Um, but again, I believe that um, the, the radio industry is 
right on insofar as developing HD radio. HD radio is going to provide uh, where there's one radio station, there might be four radio stations. So if anything, there's more choices. These uh, services are going to offer uh, more programming choices to the consumer. And once again, I think this is, you know, do we compete with HD radio? Absolutely. If you go into a Best Buy or you go into a Walmart, you know, you can see a satellite radio for sale. You can see an HD radio for sale. The radio industry has said that they're investing $250 million in advertising to establish HD radio. HD radio is today offering a lot of commercial free music, free. Um, you know, we're not trying to stop it from being developed. As a matter of fact, we, we again, w the way we compete is in the marketplace, not in trying to use regulators, you know, to stop a deal. So, um, you know, I wish that, uh, you know, uh, HD radio wasn't there. It's a, comp it's a competitor for me, but I'm prepared to compete with them in the marketplace. Do you foresee the newly merged company expanding beyond North America? Right now, the satellites that we have um, really have look angles down toward, uh, you know, as far north as Canada and down, you know, to Mexico, so that if, in fact, the companies had an interest in um, expanding into other parts of the world, it would require, you know, new satellites and a whole new infrastructure. Um, from my point of view, I, I, we've not had any conversations with our, you know, uh, friends over at XM, but uh, it's been 17 years since uh, Sirius first formed as a company, and we still have not made a profit. So before we have any ideas to go into uh, any other parts of the world, we're going to really want to see us become a very profitable company before we take another 15 or 17 years to invest in an infrastructure uh, that's required. So if you, if you think about our business, uh, and we talked about a lot of the money that we've lost, um, but that, it's understandable because before we can get our first subscriber, we had to launch, we had to buy four satellites. So we paid, you know, about a billion dollars to launch three of our four satellites. We have a ground spare in place. We had to attract all of the programming because somebody isn't going to subscribe to satellite radio without the programming. So we had to make all of our programming investments. We had to make all of our investments in infrastructure, you know, and we've done all of those things. And that's why the losses have been so extreme. As we continue to grow in subscribers, we hope that we will be profitable. But when you're competing with companies like Apple and you're competing with companies like Clear Channel, you need to have every efficiency that you can have. And this merger uniquely, uniquely creates great efficiencies for our combined companies. If the merger is approved, do you foresee another competing satellite network merging? Well, there's spectrum out there, you know, I mean, there's DBS, uh, there's, you know, uh, there's a spectrum that's out there um, in a whole bunch of different areas. You know, the broadcasters are giving up their analog uh, spectrum, there's WCS spectrum that's out there. I can't tell you that anybody would need to compete with us in the satellite business. They can compete with us in the internet business. You know, it's, it's sort of all converging into that car. And whether or not when you're driving in your car, whether you're getting your signal from the satellite or you're getting it from terrestrial radio or you're getting it on your iPod or you're getting it on WiMAX, you know, it's all audio entertainment content. And I think it's less important as to, you know, whether or not it be satellite or anything else. There will be, when the two companies combine, believe me, there will be a risk factor in our statement that talks about all of the competition that the combined satellite radio company will still compete with. How does satellite radio counter the growing use of iPods and other MP3 players? And do you find that consumers forsake radio for downloadable music and programming? So once again, I mean, even by the nature of the question, you know, it's clear that we're competing in satellite radio with this other technology. I, I happen to be a big believer in the radio business. Um, and I believe that, yes, there are these other devices, and yes, they are issues that are concerned. But at the end of the day, content is what's going to drive 
the um, a, a ability of one company to prevail against other companies. And the fact that there are all of these technology opportunities out there gives content providers the opportunity to become even more and more important. And we at Sirius and XM are focused on providing the consumer with that best content. And as long as we can continue to do that, we can certainly be a very viable competitor. But, you know, it certainly is a whole lot more complicated today, you know, to compete with all of these choices that are out there than it was when I first started. And it was principally AM radio. And then FM was just starting. So it was a lot easier to compete with that than it is to compete today with all of this uh, technology. Um, again, I've said it a couple times today, the consumer is the big beneficiary of all of that choice and that the market needs to be looked at differently than it was looked at, let's say, 10 years ago when a lot of this technology wasn't there. And for anybody to think that satellite radio is not competing with all of these other devices that you've talked about either has an agenda or just doesn't have an understanding of what the marketplace is like today. How critical to the success of satellite radio is it to get uh, the product into automobiles? And once you do that, how do you compete with the hyper-local uh, content that's provided by traditional radio? We think that uh, the automobile is crucial to the success of audio content. If you think about uh, radio, it's been principally an out of home medium. You know, when you think about the home, there's a lot of other competition. You know, you're sitting there with the internet, you're sitting there with television. So, you know, in the car when you're stuck coming to work in the morning, uh, that is sort of the holy grail you know, of radio. So um, getting uh, car companies to uh, put uh, satellite radio in was a major chore uh, and a major accomplishment that the companies have. Uh, car companies are today putting satellite radio in. Car companies today are also putting in jacks for your MP3 player. Car companies today are also putting in HD radio. Every single car has an AM. FM radio, so, um, you know, there is a tremendous amount of competition in the car, not just from satellite radio, in spite of satellite radio success in getting into the car. One of the things that, uh, you know, if you think about it, there's about 243 million cars on the road today, and very few of those um, obviously have satellite radio in them. Uh, so in the case of AM, FM radio, virtually every one of those 243 million cars have AM and FM radio. So, you know, competing with the radio industry is a very challenging, difficult one. We're not looking to um, uh, eliminate them. That's just not even a possibility. But competing with local is something that we have no great agenda to do. You, you'd go to your local AM or FM radio station for your local content, and you'd go to your satellite radio for the kind of content that we offer. Earlier this year, Sirius dropped its only public service channel, C-SPAN Radio, from its lineup. Why did you take C-SPAN away, and what is your commitment to public service? Yeah, well, we have a strong commitment to public service, and, um, you know, we dropped C-SPAN because we had a contract dispute on our ability to preempt some of the content that we wanted to preempt on the weekend to accommodate uh, some other programming um, that, you know, it, it doesn't represent any lack of commitment towards C-SPAN. It's a great service. Hello, C-SPAN. Uh, you know, it, 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 you know, and anybody who's listening on XM can hear uh, C-SPAN still. Uh, you know, it's just that we had a contract dispute, and if, in fact, uh, C-SPAN was interested in resolving that contract dispute, we'd be anxious to have them back. It's a great service, and we would hope to be a partner with them in the future. Has the pending merger stalled the enrollment of new subscribers for the two companies, given that consumers may worry about the equipment that they would be getting if they subscribed now and whether it would still be useful? 
So I've heard that uh, feedback, uh, you know, from some of the people who call on uh, retailers who say that uh, there is some confusion in the marketplace and that, uh, you know, people are either confused about what's happening or holding off on what's happening. Um, but, you know, in my opinion, you know, we're still adding, you know, we have our earnings call next Tuesday, so I don't want to talk too much about it today, but that, uh, you know, we're still adding a significant amount of subscribers and we'll continue to add them. But, you know, any time when uh, there is some confusion out there, that's not necessarily uh, good news. Uh, you know, I'll take the other side of the argument is that if people are talking about satellite radio, that is good news. So uh, there may be some confusion, but on the other hand, there is more talk about satellite radio um, in connection with the merger. Would you give Don Imus another chance? So, so um, I have not had um, any conversations uh, with Don Imus uh, or his uh, people, and I know he's in a, uh, or for, I know what I read is that he's in a contract dispute um, with his current employer. I know he's in New Mexico, um, and uh, I don't know whether or not uh, Don Imus is uh, planning on coming back to radio or not. Uh, he was a terrific entertainer. I worked with him for an awful lot of years. He did great radio. He made us a lot of money. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that uh, it would be great if Don Imus was back in radio, but we have had no discussions at all. We're almost out of time, but before I ask the last question, uh, there are a couple of other important matters to take care of. First of all, let me remind the audience of our future speakers. On Wednesday, First Lady Laura Bush will be here to discuss uh, her recent trip to Africa, and her speech will be titled, Why Africa? Uh, on the 27th, which is Friday, Mike Johans, the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture Secretary, will talk, be here to talk about the Farm Bill. And on August 1st, Senator Joe Biden of Delaware will be here to give a speech titled, Promises to Keep. Also, uh, we have a lot of traditions here at the National Press Club. One is that each speaker gets a certificate, and the other is that everybody gets the much coveted National Press Club. Night. And the check? <laughs> it's in the no mail. No check. It's in the mail. No check. <laughs> okay, and the last question. Um, who, other than Howard Stern, do you listen to on a regular basis, and is there anyone who you think should be a radio host who isn't currently? Um, well, you know, I, I, I unfortunately uh, spend my time listening to uh, satellite radio and terrestrial radio more for business than for my uh, personal enjoyment. So I get an opportunity to listen to a whole bunch of uh, channels. So uh, I'm a uh, news junkie, so I listen to a lot of our news channels. I still listen occasionally to terrestrial radio, by the way. Um, I also uh, listen to sports. Um, and uh, Howard, I must uh, acknowledge, or I'm proud to acknowledge, that is uh, one of my presets on my radio, so, um, you know, he's there. Uh, you know, we've had lots of conversations, you know, um, you know, would it be a good idea to have David Letterman, you know, on radio? You know, you, you sort of take a look at the performers, you know, there have been people who say, you know, gee, Rosie O'Donnell ought to, you know, be on radio. I can tell you that um, from a serious point of view, we have our program lineup is complete. We have uh, plenty of sports, plenty of news, plenty of music, and we don't think that there is a missing piece in our puzzle. We continue to look for opportunities, so we just recently announced that we have a channel that's 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the Catholic Church. Uh, Cardinal Egan uh, provided us with that channel. Again, a niche uh, It's not available on terrestrial radio. You can't get 24 hours, seven day a week programming like we're offering in every market, you know, that we're offering it in. We added a seriously Sinatra channel with the Frank Sinatra estate. This summer we're going to add a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week Grateful Dead channel for you deadheads in the audience. So, you know, I, I think that there will constantly be a uh, evolution and an addition, you know, of programming, but there's no big missing piece um, that's not part of um, our service today. Thank you very much.
I'd like to thank you all for coming today. I'd also like to thank National Press Club staff members Joanne Boos, Melinda Cook, Pat Nelson, and Howard Rothman for organizing today's lunch. Also thanks to the NPC Library for its research. The video archive of today's luncheon is provided by the NPC's Broadcast Operations Center. Broadcast uh, tapes and uh, transcripts are available by calling 1-888-343-1940. Thank you. We're adjourned. New News Agency and the Speakers Committee member who organized today's event, Joel Frank, managing partner, and Joel Frank Wilkinson Brimmer Catcher, and a guest of the speaker, Jamila Bay, freelance radio reporter and a member of the Press Club Young Members Committee and our Professional Development Committee, Mary Lou Donahue, producer editor of Artistically Speaking, Keith Hill, editor writer with BNA and vice chairman of the Press Club Board of Governors. And Sam Holt, former head of programming at both National Pro Public Radio and the Public Broadcasting System, former senior vice president for content at World Space, the first satellite radio company, and a member of the Press Club Broadcast Committee. Our speaker today has reshaped the American radio industry, and he's not done yet. If Sirius Satellite Radio CEO Mel Karmazin gets his way, the two giants of satellite radio, Sirius and XM, will soon be one. That's a monumental change, and it's the sort of thing Karmazin has specialized in throughout his career. In the early 1980s, radio was largely a, a local enterprise, but then Karmazin took the helm of Infinity Broadcasting. Over the next few years, he built Infinity into a 180-station behemoth that, along with its rival, Clear Channel Communications, came to dominate the industry. Infinity came to dominate in part because of Karmazin's decision to hire a controversial New York DJ who had been fired by his previous employer for his vulgar on-the-air rants. That shock jock's name was Howard Stern, and the rest is radio history. But Mel Karmazin is much more than the man that made Howard Stern famous. After Westinghouse bought Infinity, Karmazin became head of CBS Radio. And when Viacom bought, bought CBS, Karmazin became president and chief operating officer of Viacom, suddenly the second largest enter entertainment company in the world. Karmazin left Viacom for personal and professional reasons in June 2004, and five months later he was named CEO of Sirius, one of two pioneers in the fledgling satellite radio business. And before long, he proved that he was, well, serious about it, signing Howard Stern to a multi-million dollar contract. Back then, Karmazin saw the satellite radio industry a little differently than he sees it today. Calling Sirius and XM the Coke and Pepsi of the business, he said, it's a big market, both companies will be very successful. Now though, Karmazin wants those two companies to merge, and not everyone is thrilled about that prospect. The National Association of Broadcasters has joined with consumer groups to ask federal regulators to stop the merger, saying it will create a satellite radio monopoly. But Karmazin stresses that there will still be extraordinary competition in the radio business, even if the merger goes forward. Uh, Karmazin, who would head the newly merged company, told Congress that the merger would be in the best interest of consumers because it would give them more radio choices at lower prices than they have today. Karmazin is here with us today to tell us more about the merger. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mel Karmazin to the National Press Club. Thank you very much. So, um, first of all, thank you very much. Um, there are a couple things that I, I just feel a responsibility to get the record straight on. Uh, I did not hire Howard Stern. Howard Stern uh, was at uh, Sirius before I got here. Um, and as a matter of fact, it was uh, Sirius's decision to hire Howard Stern that made me uh, believe how serious they were. And I joined probably um, as, you know, as a result of that. Um, I really um, would like to thank you all for uh, being here and thank you, uh, Jerry, uh, for the opportunity uh, that you're giving me. I'd also like to acknowledge, because I see him looking at me, uh, former chairman of the FCC, Jim Quello, who's in the ro room, as well as Senator Laxalt, who is in the room, and thank you both uh, for joining us today. 
Um, I'm also, um, you know, delighted to be here with Gary Parsons, uh, chairman of XM Radio, uh, and thanks to members of the National Press Club for giving me the invitation to speak to you today. I know there has been a great tradition in using this prestigious platform to speak on important matters, and we have some important matters that we are undertaking today, and we have a groundbreaking announcement that we can think of no better place to make than here at the National Press Club. In keeping with my long service in radio, I'd like to give you the headline right on the top. We plan to use the synergies of this merger to bring a la carte programming to satellite radio, to give consumers the power to choose satellite radio packages channel by channel to suit their tastes and their budgets. This is the first time that anyone in subscription entertainment has ever offered a la carte programming. Gary and I are excited to bring this unprecedented benefit to American consumers. We said when we announced our merger that we would provide more choices and lower prices than ever before, and that's what we're going to do. After the merger, here's how they will work. Sirius and XM will each offer an a la carte package, a la carte number one, for $6.99 per month. That's 46% lower than the only package that exists today. So the idea of lower prices is clearly presented here when we're committing to offer a package at $6.99 as compared to the $12.95 today. Consumers will choose the 50 channels they want from a universe of more than 100 music, sports, news, talk, and entertainment channels. Listeners will also have the option of purchasing additional channels for as little as 25 cents each. But no one, no one who selects this package will pay more than the $12.95 that they pay today. We will offer also a second a la carte package, a la carte two, at $14.99, featuring the best of both services. Consumers subscribing to this package will choose from 100 channels from a large pool, including the premium channels, on one service plus the best programming from the other service. To get this program from both companies today, you would have to pay $25. <clears throat> Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Jerry Zaremski and I'm the Washington Bureau Chief for the Buffalo News and President of the National Press Club. I'd like to welcome our club members and their guests who are here with us today, as well as the audience that's watching on C-SPAN. We're looking forward to today's speech and afterwards I will ask as many questions as time permits. Please hold your applause during the speech so that we have as much time for questions as possible. For our broadcast audience, I'd like to explain that if you hear applause during the speech, it may be from the guests and members of the general public and not necessarily from the members of the working press. I'd now like to introduce our head table guests and ask them to stand briefly when their names are called uh, from your right. Ken Melgren, uh, AP Broadcast Affiliate Relations Manager, head of the Radio and TV Museum in Bowie, Maryland, and a member of the Press Club's Broadcast Committee. Heather Forsgren Weaver, Managing Editor of Satellite Week and Satellite Beat Reporter for Communications Daily. David Johnson of Scripps Howard News Service Chief Technology Officer and a member of the Press Club Broadcast and New Media Committees. Chris Stern, Media Rep Reporter for Bloomberg. Richard Wiley, partner in Wiley Rain LLP and a former Com Federal Communications Commission Chairman and a guest of the speaker. Sarah Williams, a Voice of America news anchor and a producer of the Press Club's XM radio broadcasts. 
Gary Parsons, Chairman of the Board of XM Satellite Radio and a guest of the speaker. Skipping over the, the, the podium, Angela Gryland Keen of Bloomberg News, the Chair of the NPC Speakers Committee. Skipping over our speaker, Ron Bajans of Kuwait.